Okay. Okay. Hello to everybody. It's a great pleasure and honor to host uh, this new webinar uh, organized by the European Rhinologic Society Junior Team. And uh, tonight we'll talk about uh, the management of sinonasal cancer. And we have three speakers, uh, very well known speakers and also friends. And so it's really a pleasure to start with the webinar. And the first speaker will be Christian Mirvein. It's a junior consultant in the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And so please, uh, Christian, it's your time. And the topic of Christian will be uh, basics in synonasal malignancy for the diagnostic workup. So, hello everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot for the chance to give this talk. Thanks a lot also to Olympus for supporting this event. My name is uh, Christian Mirwan. I'm a, a member of the Ranologic Group at the ENT department of the University Hospital in Zurich. Um, and also I'm a member of the ERS Junior Board. Um, sorry for my hoarse voice. I try to speak as clearly as possible. So during the next 15 to 20 minutes, I would like to talk about the basics of um, diagnostic workup in cyanonasal malignancies. I would like to guide you via the medical history and the clinical assessment to the role of the neck and then to the crucial role of the biopsy and the exploration of the tumor under general anesthesia, then all the way to the interdisciplinary tumor board. I will not talk about the imaging and I will not talk about histology driven treatment approaches since these topics will be highlighted by Dr. Connor and Professor Gastel Novo. So I won't speak too much on epidemiology. However, in series from Northern America, usually squamous cell carcinoma is the most frequent entity. In series from Europe, it's rather adenocarcinomas and cyanonasal melanomas, which are more frequent. And there are some very known uh, occupational carcinogens, especially for intestinal type adenocarcinoma. It's namely wood and leather dust, from aldehyde, there's less evidence for asbestos, chrome, and nickel. And in contrast, for squamous cell carcinoma, of course, they reveal a slightly different risk profile with polycyclic hydrocarbons, asbestos, chrome, and nickel as risk factors. In general, we can say, and this is in contrast to uh, squamous cell carcinomas of the upper aerodigestive tract, there's only weak evidence for tobacco and actually no evidence for alcohol as risk factor. So when we're facing a patient, when, where we suspect a cyanonasal malignancy, we should always do a thorough clinical assessment, including taking a post-medical history, asking for typically unilateral symptoms, such as pain, nasal discharge, and bleeding. We, we should watch for face deformities, um, then we should do a neurologic workup, especially we should ask, uh, examine for numbness in the infraorbital region, but we should also quickly check the other uh, cranial nerves. Of course, we are no ophthalmologists, but we should do an ophthalmologic screening. We should check for loss of vision, double vision, uh, proptosis. We can do a swinging flashlight test. We can ask and look for epiphora. Um, if the lesion originates from the floor of the nose or the maxillary sinus, we also have to check the oral cavity. Um, we should check the neck uh, in order to not miss any lumps in the neck. So this is actually an overview um, of the clinical assessment as uh, I think it's important to do a general ENT examination as I've told you then the basic ophthalmologic assessment check for cranial nerve affection. We should of course do an endoscopy with rigid or flexible zero 30 degree scopes. And we should do the neck assessment, which consists of palpation, ultrasound, fine needle aspiration of any suspicious lymph nodes. And 
at this point, I would uh, talk a little bit on the role of the neck. It's very important to realize that lymph node metastases at initial presentation, they are rare. Um, typically, uh, there are certain uh, no, known uh, risk uh, levels. Uh, it's usually the ipsilateral and contralateral level one and two, as well as the rich of pharyngeal lymph nodes, which are the most important levels to examine. And we know that there are certain risk factors for the development of regional metastasis. Um, usually it's the histological subtype, uh, olfactory neuroblastomas, neuroendocrine carcinomas, and especially squamous cell carcinomas um, in the maxillary sinus, especially those uh, arising from the floor of the maxillary sinus. And at this point, I would also uh, talk a little bit on the controversial role of the elective neck treatment. Um, elective neck treatment can be either elective neck dissection or elective neck irradiation. And um, when we have a look at the literature, most centers and also our institution recommend elective neck treatment uh, in, in, for instance, advanced maxillary sinus squamous cell carcinomas, T3, T4, uh, advanced olfactory neuroblastomas with skull base infiltration, and also uh, poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinomas and SNOOK. And so elective neck treatment can either be uh, neck dissection uh, depending on the treatment plan, along with preparation of the vessels, uh, is, for instance, uh, when we're doing a free flap, or it can mean uh, elective neck irradiation. I don't want to say too much on the imaging since, since Dr. Connor will have this talk, but uh, to keep it very basic, we can say we have the conventional cross-sectional imaging consisting of CT and MRI, and then we have the hybrid PET imaging consisting of um, PET-CT and more recently PET-MRI. And um, the demand on the imaging is actually to get a profound statement on the epicenter of the tumor, we have to know um, the relationship of the tumor to the bony skull base, to the dural skull base, but also to the brain. We have to know the relationship of the tumor to the orbit, especially the medial orbital wall, but also to the other contents of the orbit. Um, we have to see whether there is tumor growth uh, towards the heart palate or towards the soft tissue or the skin. And, and the, the huge challenge that we usually face at this point of the diagnostic workup is that we have to deal with potentially false positive or false negative results that we have to interpret. And so at this point, I would like uh, to talk about the crucial role of the biopsy and the tumor exploration. This is something that should usually be done under a general anesthesia. Um, we recommend to avoid office-based biopsy since they mainly uh, cause discomfort, they cause bleeding, and they also harbor the risk of non-representative tissue samples. There is, for instance, a study um, for cyanonasal malignancies from 2018, where it was shown that the biopsy volume actually determines uh, the rate of discrepancy between pathologists. Always do the biopsy after the imaging to avoid any false positive findings. And due to the rarity of the disease, the histopathological analysis should be done by a dedicated head and neck pathologist um, who has a specific expertise for cyanonase malignancies. This is particularly important because during the last years, we have learned that actually every cyanonase malignancy, every tumor, has its own molecular fingerprint, and, and this fingerprint has implication for prognosis and also for targeted therapy. So to illustrate this, um, I would like to present you this table, which actually reflects the uh, developing of the landscape. Uh, this is not the whole spectrum of cyanonase malignancies, but it shows how many different tumors that we know. And for instance, um, there is a, a huge resemblance between adenoid cystic carcinoma and HPV-related multi-phenotypical carcinoma, which can be usually differentiated uh, by, the by the presence or the absence of the fusion of MYB, NFIB, uh, uh, which is typically present in adenoid cystic carcinoma, but absent in HPV-related multi-phenotypical carcinoma. And 
So to do this differentiation, this requires a dedicated head and neck pathologist with expertise for cyanonasal malignancies. So um, this is the workup how we recommend it to do. You can do the biopsy under general anesthesia. You can do the tumoral exploration then, for instance, while waiting for frozen section, if you're doing frozen section. And then this tumor exploration should actually consist of a, of a thorough assessment of the orbit and of the, of the skull base. We should have a statement uh, with regard to the medial orbital wall, to the anterior skull base, uh, the cribriform plate, the frontal sinus, the sphenoid sinus, the nasal floor, and the nasal septum. So all these localizations we should assess uh, during the biopsy and the tumor exploration. Why is this important? We had a look at our own data, and then we actually uh, compared the T category based on the clinical and radiological uh, classification to the T category after the tumor exploration with the with the information that we obtained from the tumor exploration. And we found that there is actually a significant proportion of upstaging and downstaging in those patients. And this is why it is so important to have this information that we uh, achieve uh, during uh, the tumor exploration. So there are two uh, very important localizations where we have to be very careful. The first thing is the medial orbital wall. As we could show, um, there is a trend uh, to overestimate the true extent of infiltration for the medial orbital wall. This is a patient with a cyanonasal adenocarcinoma of the nasal cavity. Uh, these are the MRI and the CT scans. I won't say too much on that uh, since Dr. Connor will have this talk, but on these slides, you, you have the impression that the medial rectus fossil cannot be properly separated uh, from the tumor. Um, and also the bony lamina papyracea cannot be seen anymore on the CT scan. But then um, during the, the, the tumor exploration and also uh, the histopathological workup work actually revealed only the pressure erosion uh, of the orbit and no orbital infiltration. So this is an example of overestimation um, of the of the true extension of the tumor with regard to the medial orbital wall. And the second, the second example that I would like to show is for the anterior skull base. Uh, this is also an adenocarcinoma patient uh, where, we see, where you can see um, the bulging of the tumor into the anterior cranial fossa. You see that also the, bo the bony uh, skull base um, is interrupted. So you can suspect uh, an underlying dis disruptive uh, lesion. But uh, also, and uh, similar to the case before, there was no evidence of infiltration uh, during, uh, the, uh, during the surgery. So what we have learned from our own data is that for the, for the anterior skull base, you actually um, have uh, to be prepared for false positive and false negative imaging findings, which usually can also only be clarified uh, by means of tumor exploration or even histopathology biopsy of the dural or the bony skull base. This is, this is a table which actually only summarizes the information from the eighth version of the WHO classification of head and neck tumors, especially for those of the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinuses. Of, of course, there's another one for the maxillary sinus, but this is, what, this is just to show you why it is so important to know uh, the details with regard to the extension of the tumor. For instance, while an infiltration of the cribriform plate renders the tumor a CT3, an infiltration of the dura renders the tumor a CT4B. So we have to know all these details in order to properly, properly uh, categorize uh, the, the tumor. And another very important fact is that um, to know exactly the extension of the primary tumor is not only very important to determine the T category, as it was shown, uh, the primary tumor is also the main prognosticator of outcome. So for instance, um, we could show that T category is an independent factor for achievement of complete remission and also of overall survival. And um, just to illustrate this, an increase uh, in T classification, for instance, from T3 to T4A decreases the chance for complete remission by 
and in contrary increases the risk of death by 81%. And then when we have a look at the pattern of treatment failures in the further course of the disease, it's the isolated local failure, which is by far the most common treatment failure. There's an exception, uh, for instance, for cyanonasal mucosal melanomas, which exhibit high rates of distant metastasis, but in general, it's usually the primary tumor which causes the treatment failure. And this is actually already my last slide, and we created this in analogy to triple endoscopy in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma of the upper aerodigestive tract. It shows the roadmap, um, the roadmap to the interdisciplinary tumor board. So we start with the post-medical history. We examine the, the patient, we assess the risk factors. We then do the cross-sectional imaging consisting of CT and MRI usually. We can do hybrid PET imaging in, in certain high-risk situations. And then the crucial role of the tumor biopsy and of the tumor exploration, which should be done under general anesthesia. We then require a state-of-the-art histopathological workup, including all the, the, the modern molecular biomarkers to get the specific fingerprint of the tumor. And then we're ready for the interdisciplinary tumor board. Uh, and from there on, then we can go uh, to the treatment plans and after that uh, to the follow-up. So this is what I wanted uh, to show you in terms of the roadmap for the workup. Um, I thank you very much for the attention and um, I'm ha very happy to maybe answer questions at, at, at the end of, the, uh, of our session and I will hand over now to the next speaker. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you. Thank you really uh, to Christian for the outstanding presentation. And now it's time to go in deep with the uh, diagnosis of paranasal sinus cancer, especially analyzing the imaging patterns of this disease that is so crucial for planning treatment and also for a prognosis. So please, Steve, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Um, I'm great, grateful for the opportunity to be talking to you this evening and for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to be talking about imaging in uh, malignant cyanonasal neoplasms. And I want to have a sort of three-pronged approach. I'll talk about the detection um, and obviously these tumors often coexist with uh, the ubiquitous inflammatory disease. So I'll try and point out um, some indicators of a malignant neoplasm versus other pathologies. I'd like to talk about the diagnosis. Now clearly um, these tumors are usually amenable to biopsy uh, and that is the way of obtaining histological diagnosis. But I'd like to give some pointers um, as to what thing about aspects of the imaging that can help us with the uh, potential diagnosis and some other, other features that might be useful prior to biopsy. And finally, most importantly, I want to talk about the mapping and staging of the tumors. They're obviously may become very advanced. They're aggressive tumors with extra compartmental extension. And it's important to be able to accurately stage this as Christian's already indicated, uh, which is going to impact on surgical receptability, prognosis and any radiotherapy planning. So just very briefly, I'll cover the advantages of CT and MRI in this respect, and they're often um, used in a complementary factor in that fashion because they have, have very different uh, uh, beneficial features. First of all, CT has excellent spatial resolution. It's, it's particularly good at examining cortical bone. So when we're interested in the anterior skull base and the orbital walls, um, it's very effective in depicting these. The bone air interfaces, obviously, therefore, becomes an excellent uh, surgical roadmap. Um, has innate contrast in these areas, and we will require high resolution submillimetric acquisitions, which we can then reformat in various planes uh, as required. MRI, on the other hand, rather than spatial resolution, it really excels at contrast resolution. So therefore, it's able to pick up on, um, on features such as uh, detecting and delineating the nerves at the skull base, and also soft tissue structures such as the periorbiter or the periosteum, which are not depicted with CT. It's very good at bone marrow pathology. So when we're interested in the central skull base rather than the cortical bone of the anterior skull base, MRI comes into its own. But we must always use dedicated protocols with small fields of view, not apply standard soft tissue face and imaging in this respect. And this usually comprises a series of different sequences, including T1 and T2 weighted sequences, um, potentially using fat saturation to accentuate the, uh, the effects of gadolinium enhancement. When we're using the T2 weighted sequences, very much recommend that a high resolution, particularly with a 512 matrix is used to try and better depict some of the low T2 signal structures that we're interested in. And in a number of centers, 3D sequences will also be uh, used as well. 
just very briefly what we'll be expecting to see on MRI in the, in the, the situations and the various anatomical substrates we're interested in here. Most tumors will be T, T1 iso intense or hypo intense. Uh, fat and proteinaceous fluid, for instance, obstructed secretions here and fat is going to be bright T1 signal and obviously therefore have a great deal of contrast with the tumor. Cortical bone, periosteum and air will all be a signal void. When it comes to T2-weighted imaging, tumors tend to be iso-intense because of the cell cellularity. Fat, inflammatory and soft tissue tends to be hyper-intense. So here we can see the, the contrasting T2 hyper-intense inflammatory change. And again, cortical bone, periosteum and air will be black. It will be a signal void. When it comes to gadolinium, most tumors are going to be enhancing moderately rather than markedly. And they often have some degree of heterogeneity to the enhancement, whereas inflammatory mucosal thickening will be markedly enhancing and hence may be able to distinguish from the tumor. So on to detection and recognition of tumors, first of all, and this will often be first done when a CT is performed, maybe in a patient with more nonspecific clinical features. We must always be on the lookout for areas of cortical bone destruction, which might indicate another pathology, particularly up at the anterior skull base, the ethmoid trabecule and the medial orbital walls. And, in, in, but remember that this uh, bony destruction can also occur secondary to pressure deossification from benign disease. And also it's not absolutely specific for malignant tumors because the same patterns of destruction may occur due to, to, to entities such as this, which is invasive fungal sinus disease. Another indicator that we must consider the potential for a malignancy is single site disease. So clearly if you see an isolated nasal polyp on the, uh, the CT paranasal sinuses, uh, that is a consideration will potentially require biopsy. This also extends to isolated sinus disease, either within the maxillary antrum or exactly the same risks of malignancy also in the sphenoid sinus. And often MRI problem solves this prior to consideration um, of further intervention. There may be other features, for instance, even with these low dose uh, CT protocols that we use, it's possible to do th thick section reformats whereby we can see the soft tissues. And on these, you must look around the sinuses for any evidence of extra sinus soft tissue involvement, either the pterygopalatine fossa, the premaxillary region or the retromaxillary region here that indicates something else that's going on other than inflammatory sinus disease. But what about on MRI? What can be gleaned from an MRI to suggest sinonasal malignancy? Well, it's, this is the key thing. It's looking for intermediate T2 signal masses. And this is an example here. We've got an intermediate T2 signal nasal adenocarcinoma. Here we've got a nasal lymphoma. Most uh, malignant tumors are cellular, therefore T2 iso intense. There are some exceptions, for instance, some chondrosarcomas. Uh, for instance, some adenoid cystics and other salivary gland neoplasms may occasionally be a bit more T2 hyper intense. But this is as distinguished from this sort of mass, which is an antraquinal polyp, which is going to be bright T2 signal and show peripheral enhancement, hence distinct, distinguishing it from a malignant cytonasal neoplasm. Now, one major complicating factor is the variable variable signal returned by obstructed secre secretions. You can see that varying on the protein content, we get variable T1 and T2 signal. Now this patient has got a nasoethmoid carcinoma, you can see this heterogeneous enhancement, but look within the maxillary antrum, we've got very variable um, signal returned by this, which may therefore potentially mimic tumor if we just looked at one individual sequence. So it's always important to line up the various sequences next to each other and analyze the signal on each different sequence. So therefore not confusing it with uh, a cyanonasal neoplasm. What other features do we have? Well, a variable enhancement and necrosis, ill-defined borders, potential for imaging the perineural uh, spread. And there are some advanced um, imaging techniques which may occasionally be employed. So here's just an example of a heterogeneously enhancing maxillary antrum tumor. We've got perineural extension along the maxillary nerve seen posteriorly, which is really diagnoses it as a maxillary, as a uh, malignant neoplasm. Now, as I said, diffusion and perfusion imaging may be applied. They're rarely the primary way of, of diagnosing or evaluating cyanonasal neoplasms, but there is some literature which shows that it distinguishes by quantification of the ADC malignant from benign neoplasms. Perfusion imaging does have some diagnostic benefit, but it has extra challenges in terms of, um, of uh, instilling it to, within the pipeline of diagnosis. So going on to diagnosis now, and as I said, biopsy is clearly the way that we normally diagnose these tumors, but in fact, the CT and MRI may give us some useful pointers and useful information to, uh, to require prior to biopsy. 
Now, the pattern of bony destruction on these CTs is very, very different in very malignant tumors. So, for instance, there's nut midline carcinoma and melanoma here. Other aggressive uh, tumors, such as SMART B1 deficient cyanidal carcinomas, have the very same uh, patterns of complete bony destruction, no evidence of remodeling of bone, no displacement of bone, just shorn off bone at its margins. This is in contradistinction to the patterns that we get with very, very benign, slow growing neoplasms as shown here. Unfortunately, quite a large majority of cases have this intermediate pattern. And for instance, lower grade sarcomas, lymphomas and carcinomas can all have a pattern whereby there is some destruction of bone, but also some displacement. And in this situation, it's actually very difficult to distinguish from a number of other benign diagnoses, which can have the same pattern and cause some bone erosion due to pressure deossification. The presence of calcification within the center of lesions can have some diagnostic benefit, for instance, chondroid calcification in this chondrosarcoma. You might see calcifications again in SMART B1 deficient carcinomas and also within olfactory neuroblastomas. Now, remember, there's always an imaging differential diagnosis for cyanonasal mass lesions, uh, which is helpful to, to anticipate from the CT. For instance, a meninga seal here, maybe not particularly clear on the CT, but very, very clear on the MRI. And you can see it's not very, very far dif um, different in terms of its CT imaging appearances from this adenocarcinoma in the nasoethmoid region. Another important feature to try and detect on MRI is the presence of little, a lot of little punctate flowboids within the lesion, which will indicate vascularity and the potential for hemorrhage at biopsy. When you've got tumors that extend through the skull base, the presence of peritumoral cysts is quite a strong predictor of olfactory neuroblastoma, although not absolutely specific. So that's another feature that we might be able to use diagnostically. So finally, moving on to tumor mapping and staging, and we're gonna use both CT and MRI uh, in this regard. And as I said, memory, many of these have extra compartmental extension, which is going, to indi indi is going to indicate the potential for susceptibility and prognosis. I'm going to deal with um, particular patterns, extension through the anterior skull base, primarily by direct extension. Um, orbits, again, primarily by direct extension, although can extend through perineural channels, for instance, along the infraorbital nerve, through the orbital fissures, as well and along the nasolacrimal gut, gut duct. And also extension into the deep facial spaces, the central skull base and pterygopalatine fossa, which may be direct or perineural. We must always consider the potential for nodal staging. Christian uh, did, did mention this. And the one message I would like to um, reiterate is that we need to look away from the deep cervical nodes often. For instance, the anterior paranasal sinuses and the nasoethmoid region may drain to levels 1b. Um, the posterior ethmoid and sphenoid sinus to the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. So they're very important um, areas to assess. And in particular, it may mean that ultrasound is not going to pick up on these deep, particularly retropharyngeal lymph nodes. Olfactory neuroblastoma up to 20, 25% risk of, uh, of nodal extension. Systemic staging also needs, is important with more malignant neoplasms, and we may need to consider uh, the use of PET-CT in some of the more malignant neoplasms as well. So going on to skull base extension, first of all, and by direct extension, this is for nasoethmoid tumors, particularly anterior skull base, um, but also extension, particularly using MRI to pick up on central skull base marrow involvement when we've got a sphenoid sinus tumor. So what are the questions we need to answer? Well, first of all, we want to see if we just look at the intrasinus extension, does the tumor abut the skull base? Now we can show this here, it's extending to the skull base, these various maxillary sinus tumor, this nasoethmoid tumor here. What we can't tell you is whether there is a tumor actually invading the mucosa, which is important to determine whether it's going to be potentially involved in the adjacent bone and whether that will need resecting. We then need to assess whether there is extension to the bone and the dura, um, the CT is very, very good at picking up on extension to um, the bone, but what it doesn't pick up on is, is the integrity to the periosteal dura. And MRI is the only, um, only imaging investigation that's able to do this. So here we've got the same patient, deficient bone, but intact dura. Another case for Rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma shows that there's deficiency of that low signal uh, periosteum. So it's showing that there's potential. We've now got tumor abutting the dura, so that need, may need to be addressed. Involvement of the dura itself has got a number of potential imaging features which may aid us. Nodular dural enhancement, you can see here. Peel enhancement, as you can see here. And potential for looking at dural thickness. The, the, the thickness of the dura is important and has been proposed both two millimeters and five millimeters as the upper limits of normal. And this may help us try and distinguish dural invasion from reactive dural enhancement that you can see more laterally here. <clears throat> 
I quite like this imaging feature, which has been recently proposed, which basically shows what the um, what the angle of um, of extension is with respect to the anterior skull base. So we've got two angles here. We've got a very obtuse angle and we've got a very acute angle. And it's shown that if there's contact by more than 45 degree angle, that's very predictive of anterior skull base uh, extension. Also, a regular dura and nodular dura enhancement, in this case, greater than two millimeters, was proposed in this paper, and with pretty high positive predictive values. What we have to appreciate is there is a negative predictive value, again, in and around 80 to 90 percent. So, as previously mentioned, we need to be prepared for situations where it's going to be over or underestimated. And it's going to be particularly important involvement of dura as we go more laterally to try and predict whether an endoscopic approach is going to be feasible. The extension into the brain itself can also be predicted. Actually, brain edema is not particularly helpful, but if you see enhancement, irregular enhancement extending into the brain, that's an important feature, which is then going to influence receptability uh, and management, particularly in more aggressive cyanonasal uh, neoplasms. So going on to the orbit now, we've uh, touched on this already, and there are some imaging features such as erosion of the lamina propitia, particularly prone to erosion anteriorly where it's most thin, whether the periorbiter is invaded, this low T2 signal rim that we see on MRI, and whether there's direct changes within the orbit, such as fat stranding or signal changes within the extraocular muscles. Again, I'd really suggest using these high resolution T2 weighted sequences in order to evaluate both the periorbiter and the periosteum at the skull base. So this low T2 signal here um, is, is intact and it has a very high negative predictive value for um, in orbital invasion. Where we fall down, however, is, is, is the poor positive predictive value, as low as 50% in a number of series. So for instance, in this case here, we've got some irregularity and, and some partial attenuation of the periorbiter on the T2 weighted images, but it wasn't actually invaded. And it's this positive predictive value, which is a particular problem. And hence, there may be the potential need for frozen sections of biopsies at surgery in order for, for mapping. And as previously mentioned, the whole imaging assessment may be uh, no, overall not particularly diagnostic accurate in terms of predicting the TNM staging. Probably up to a third will be upstage uh, on TNM staging at surgery. But in this case, there was involvement of the orbit through direct invasion. The success, how successful any imaging sign also depends on its inter-observer agreement. And as you can see from these statistics, they're not particularly impressive. Um, so I would say, these diagnostic signs for orbital invasion uh, are, are not in any way perfect. Finally, perineural extension. This is maybe 40%, it may be asymptomatic in up to 40% of individuals. So it's something that always needs to be entertained most frequently along the, the V2 division. So a number of characteristic tumors have these um, neural cell adhesion receptors, which have a predilection for perineural extension. And MRI is pretty, pretty good at picking up on perineural extension, has high diagnostic accuracies in a number of series. What are the features where well, we want to look for enlargement of the skull based foramina, loss of the fat planes on CT and MRI, but particularly on MRI, we want to look at thickening and neural enhancement of the, of the nerves. And particularly, we're going to use fat saturated post gadolinium sequences in this regard. Now, the pterygopalatine fossa is a very key area that we want to view. And if you ever see involvement of the pterygopalatine fossa on either CT or MRI, we need to very much look for evidence of perineural extension. It's a crossroads uh, for extension along these various nerves. So just to quickly point out a couple of useful bits of anatomy, when looking at the coronal section through the central skull base, the vidian canal here is the inframedial um, nerve and the maxillary nerve is the supramedial nerve. And it's quite an easy thing to identify and hence, uh, hence define perineal extension within the central skull base. You can see that there is normal enhancement with these nerves because of the adjacent um, perineural venous plexus and it can be slightly asymmetric as well. So there's some examples of perineural tumor extension. We've got vidian nerve here, got maxillary nerve here, we've got extension through the orbital fissures and we've got extension through the mandibular nerve, all characterized by thickening and enhancement. So um, if, the final thing I just want to mention is advanced disease. And this is obviously something that we want to pick up on. It's something that may influence in certain tumor types, um, a careful consideration and multidisciplinary decision-making. The sorts of things we want to consider are bilateral orbital involvement at the apex in particular, involvement of the carotid, cavernous sinus, extension to the brainstem, involvement to the clivus. And all these things, are going to increase the uh, potential um, surgical morbidity and for involved margins.
So I hope that's given you a, a few more sort of tips and pointers in terms of detection, diagnosis and mapping of malignancy. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you for your nice pictures and also for your uh, very useful advices. So now it's time to move our attention to the treatment. That's why we have invited Professor Paolo Castelnuovo. He's a very well-known surgeon uh, and with very large experience in the management of uh, Sinonasal cancer in the management from surgical viewpoint, but also from the multidisciplinary viewpoint. And so I would like to invite Professor Castelnuovo to share the screen. Thank you very much, Professor. And also to uh, open your camera. Okay, perfect. If you also can switch on your camera, thank you very much. And Professor Castelnuovo will talk about the histology-driven treatment strategies in the management of paranasal sinus cancer. Thank you, Professor. So many thanks for the invitation. And uh, well, we start with the, sorry. Okay. So we already, heard about the, the challenge, the different challenge of this tumor, rare tumor. And uh, the major challenge is the number of the different histotypes. With a high different behavior, biological behavior. So it's mandatory to understand very deeply the original histotype with the histology examination, but with the genetic and molecular examination to identify the different subtype. We have different uh, treatment for this tumor, the surgery, radio, chemo, immunotherapy, and target therapy. And uh, the uh, tumor board is the entity who take the decision no one patient will be treated uh, by the decision on one specialist, otolaryngologist or medical oncologist or radiation. It's the tumor board that take the decision. And uh, we understood as a surgeon that in many cases, the surgery is not the first option. So a very uh, deep, knowledge regarding the histotype uh, drive, drives our decision, the decision of the tumor board. We can divide the a very large number of uh, histotype in three major groups, the high grade, intermediate grade, and low grade tumors. For the high grade, like SNAC, SNAC neuroendocrine, G3 squamous cell carcinoma and Ewing sarcoma, we never start with the surgery. The first option, the best option is to start with chemo. And then in some case, chemo radiation exclusive and surgery only for the persistence of the disease, the recurrence. For the second group, um, adenocarcinoma, adenoid cystic carcinoma, adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, surgery can be the first option, followed by radiotherapy, adjuvant radiotherapy, and in very selected case, chemo. For the low-grade tumors, adenoid cystic carcinoma, olfactory neuroblastoma, a B phenotype, sinonasal sarcoma, surgery is the first option with adjuvant radiotherapy. Of course, this is only an indication because uh, inside the single histotype like olfactory neurostoma, we will see that can be very high difference in the aggressive test of the lesion. This is an example of a lady that uh, will uh, complain 
anosmia and nasal obstruction, and you can see the large tumor. And uh, what we can do, the first uh, biopsy gives us the result of olfactor neuroblastoma EM3. But of course, in such a case, we always uh, go for revision histology, for second opinion. And uh, with the EM3 olfactory neuroblastoma, we can move for surgery, but uh, the second uh, uh, opinion in this case gives a different result, a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. So the option for this tumor is always induction chemo. And then we have to evaluate the reduction of the tumor. If the reduction of the tumor after three, four rounds of chemo is more than 80%, we move for chemo radio exclusive. If we have a good uh, answer, but not such, uh, a reduction of the volume, we move for a three modality chemo, surgery, and then adjuvant radiotherapy. This lady was treated only with the chemo radiation exclusive. And this was uh, three months after treatment and this three years after treatment. Of course, we have a, a protocol for this very aggressive tumor, so the first group, with a multidisciplinary consultation and induction chemo. And uh, for the different histotype, we use different drugs for the poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, sinonasal undifferentiated, or for the neuroendocrine, different protocol. Uh, with the cisplatins or with the low covering. And uh, the first result of this uh, study was that the induction chemo can stratificate the patient with, that have a good responder or no, and can give a very valuable uh, projection for the prognosis. In the second group, intermediate tumors like adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, they are the more frequent tumor in our uh, group, in our cases, we have to move for surgery. So we have already understood how pathology drives the decision. But for the surgery, the extension of the tumor drive the decision. So magnetic resonance is mandatory. There is no any competition in between the different technique, endonasal, endonasal resection of the, with craniectomy, cranioendoscopic resection, craniofascial resection, no any competition. It's a different indication. The goal, the target of the surgery is free margin resection. So we need to be able to reach all the boundaries of the tumor with these techniques, or we can use a multi-portal approach, but the criteria is the free margin resection. So with the involvement of nasal posa of the lateral wall of the maxillary sinus, of course, we never can reach this goal with an endonasal approach. So in all our center, all the four different surgical approach has to be available for the treatment of this patient. Uh, regarding, concerning the endonasal approach, the endonasal resection is not it's anatomical oriented resection. We have to resect level by level with the complete control of the border and with the free margin resection. So we make tumor debarking and we understand where is the pedicle of the tumor. And then we remove the bone and the dura or the bone and the periorbit 
and we make uh, at least 10, 15 frozen sections during the surgery to reach the goal. So it's an oriented, it's a not a piecemeal resection, but it's an anatomical oriented resection. We call tumor disassembling to give the idea of this surgical approach. In the second group of uh, this tumor, uh, for instance, in the sironasal adenocarcinoma, for the low gray, the first treatment is surgery. For a high grade tumor, surgery plus adjuvant radiotherapy. In very selected case with the P53 mutation, we can use a, in a key induction chemo. And uh, when there is a, a non-functional P53, the uh, induction chemo give us a worse results. But with the functional P53, the induction chemo, you can appreciate the better overall survival and disease-free survival we got. Inside the adenocarcinoma, we have different grading with the lower and the higher grading. And it's different that the disease-free survival after three and after 10 years there is a worsening of the result after 10 years and the same for 15 years. And so you have to consider that in this patient, you have to make a follow-up, a tumor follow-up for all the life. And the inside adenocarcinoma, intestinal type, we have a different subtype. Hey, look how different is that three year cumulative survival in papillary type 82 and in mucinous type single drink zero. So it's a dramatically different. And we have to know not only the histotype, but the subtype. We already know that it's a occupational disease and uh, this is a case of woodworker in which we can perform a surgery with the monolateral resection of the tumor and with the, the reconstruction with the two layer of fasciolata. And then we use the so-called flip-flop. So the contralateral mucoperiosteum as a third layer. So we can preserve the olfaction of the contralateral side. And this was the result. So the contralateral mucoperiosteum make the third layer of the reconstruction. Squamous cell carcinoma. Again, the gold star done in surgery with the adjuvant radiotherapy. But in the high grade G3 squamous cell carcinoma, we use induction chemo. And I already show you the better result with induction chemo. Again, resection of the tumor uh, in this case, and uh, then adjuvant chemo and uh, adjuvant immunotherapy. Uh, Adenoid cystic carcinoma. Adenoid cystic carcinoma, once again, we have to consider that uh, the perzin uh, classification with the one, two, three, three grade, and the third grade with the solid component give the worst result, the worst outcome, overall survival, look the differences with the third group. So of course we have to understand and uh, uh, the gold standard for this tumor is uh, surgery plus radiotherapy, the improve overall survival and disease-free survival. But Despite any treatment you have to do, the higher recurrence of this tumor with a rate of 40, 60% give us the idea that we have to perform a follow-up for many, many years. In the last uh, 10 years, uh, the adjuvant radiation is done with the carbon ion therapy in the adenoid cystic carcinoma. And uh, 
sometimes in selected case, we have to uh, perform the only radiation, especially when there is the involvement of the uh, cavernous sinus. In those cases, we can perform exclusive radiation therapy with the carbon ion. This was the result after three years in this patient with the invasion of the cavernous. And sometimes we have to combine with the radio, with the chem, with the surgery first, and then uh, adjuvant radiation with carbon ion. But we have only to discuss every single case to perform a tailored treatment. For instance, if you are able to make a gross total resection, at least 95% of the lesion removed with surgery, you can move for radiation, adjuvant radiation. But if you do a uh, debarking of 50%, there is no sense. It's better to move for exclusive radiation. So the combination surgery plus radiotherapy, you can do if you are able at least to remove the 95% of the mass. Of course, in the recurrent or metastatic disease, nowadays we can use a, a levatinib a treatment, a, a target treatment with the tyrokinase inhibitors. And uh, this is a case of olfactory neuroblastoma and uh, with the production of uh, uh, HTH secretion, and uh, we do perform surgery because of EMS type two. And you see that uh, post-operative, the secretion of the hormonal secretion was dropped down. Was. And for a factory neuroblastoma, it's uh, mandatory to uh, identificate the EMS grade because EMS one, two, three, the first option is surgery. EMS4 is a completely different tumor. So one, two, three can be integrated in the third, in the, uh, third group, low grade group. But EMS4, it's the same behavior of neuroendocrine. So it's in the first group, very aggressive tumor. And the second thing is that uh, the um, adjuvant radiation in the, this tumor, when the dura is involved, it's mandatory to make the neck irradiation and the retropharyngeal node irradiation. Somastatin analogs evidence, we can use this for diagnosis with the octroscan and also for the treatment of the metastatic disease. So to identify the stomatin stat analogs in the olfactory neuroblastoma. This is a very large study on olfactory neuroblastoma in which we understand that the invasion of the dura is the more significant prognostic indicator. And for that, we propose to change the staging of Kaddish to put dural invasion or no dural invasion and dural invasion is a critical point. And uh, again, the identification of stomatostatin analog can drive the different treatment. For melanoma, we know that melanoma start with stage three for the aggressiveness of the, this disease. And uh, target therapy and immunotherapy are the last development. This is more important for cutaneous melanoma because the expression of this gene in mucosal melanoma is lower. But there is uh, some in, uh, interesting uh, result with the, the, this drug now available. Uh, more interesting is the immunotherapy in the mucosal melanoma because with the double blockage 
with the, this monoclonal antibiotics with the Nirumab, Apilumab, the double checkpoint blockage give some better result in the unresecable tumor on in metastatic disease. We already un, uh, saw in the first uh, lecture the importance of the new entities. So the INI1 inhibitor, the NUT midline carcinoma are very, very aggressive tumors. So there are new entities that is mandatory to detect and to understand. HPV related multicarcinoma and uh, biphenotypic sarcoma are the other loss. But we, I have finished my time. So concerning these new entities, we have to take in account their aggressivity. So in conclusion, a correct diagnosis means that for have a discussion with the tumor board, we need to know the subtype of the this different histotype with the more aggressive type. So this is a knowledge mandatory to the, take the decision which kind of treatment. And then the extension of the tumor, we saw the importance of the, of the magnetic resonance. So, Tumor board is mandatory to take the right decision for the best treatment. And in conclusion, the oncologic board has to be very, very expert and with a close relationship mean between the different uh, specialties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Castelmo, for your experience. And uh, we have fully understand how much is important the multidisciplinary management of such rare disease. And so uh, to conclude this uh, very good session, we will ask you to the participants, if there is some question, you can raise your question. Now it's the uh, good moment to raise your question to the panelists. We have some question from the audience or some some comments from the panelists. You can also use the chat if you want to type your question. I can say the question for you. You can type your question in the chat if you want. And you can also add some comments. Okay. Uh, yes, there's one question from the audience. Can you see it, Mario, or show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Claudio asked this. In the example of the adenocarcinoma pushing towards the orbit, how can the tumor be explored to rule out medial orbital wall compromise without actually doing surgery on the bulking, uh, without doing any etomoidectomy? So I think it's for you, Christian, this question regarding the large biopsy and exploration of a nasal cavity in order to fully understand the distribution of a tumor in the diagnostic phase. Well, thanks a lot for this very uh, important and interesting question. Of course, um, when we're doing the biopsy and when we're doing the, the tumor exploration, uh, we always have to balance the risk against uh, the potential benefit that, can we, that we can achieve from the exploration. Of course, we do not gonna uh, harm the orbit just to, just to know whether the tumor has also infiltrated, for example, um, the, the orbital adipose tissue. And it's all, also something that usually requires a lot of experience to do the tumor exploration. And I think it's something that should be done by a senior surgeon to at least be attending the tumor exploration when you're doing this, because uh, it is something that, uh, as I've uh, said, requires a lot of experience. And then, I mean, in doubt, we do not harm the patient just uh, to get the information, but it's just a concept that we try to establish in analogy to the um, head and neck squamous cell carcinomas of the upper aerodigestive tract, so that we should have as much as information as possible for the tumor board. If you can have a comment. Uh, so the tumor exploration during biopsy, you can do in reality only if there is a very small tumor. If it is a large tumor, uh, 
Of course, tumor exploration is mandatory, but during the surgery. Because uh, uh, the key point when do do the surgery is to make a central debulking of the lesion without affecting the healthy mucosa to understand the pedicle, especially in uh, older patient, uh, 70, 80, 90 years old, uh, sometimes the pedicle of the tumor is very small. Yeah, I completely agree. I think the key point is just to try to achieve as much possible as we can during the biopsy. Um, and I think we have more information on the tumor when we try to explore it, uh, try to explore the tumor compared to not doing it. But of course, as you, I completely agree with Professor Castanovo. Great. So we have another question for Professor Castelnuovo uh, regarding elective neck irradiation in olfactory neuroblastoma that significantly reduce neck recurrence in N0 patients. However, some studies show that it does not improve overall survival. What do you think about avoiding elective neck irradiation and perform salvage surgery of a neck recurrences? So it means wait for the recurrences in the neck and then do salvage surgery. So I have no scientific data for that, but my personal experience is that in the aggressive olfactory neuroblastoma, so in the high grade or when the tumor touch the dura, the irradiation is mandatory in my experience. Neck irradiation, of course, the final outcome can be more related to the biology of the tumor, that to the treatment, but also the radiation of the retropharyngeal neck is, uh, is mandatory, it's very important. Yeah, yeah, because probably sometimes it's not possible to do salvage surgery, it depends from the location. If oh, yes. involvement of metastatic disease in the retropharyngeal nodes, for example, it's quite hard to do salvage surgery. Okay, thank you very much, Claudio, for your question. Uh, we have some other question from the audience or from the panelists. Thank you very much for your interaction. That will be very, very interesting. And it's the, the real sense of this webinar of the Junior ERS Society. Okay, I think if there is no other question, We'll see, we can wait for another question, but if no other questions are present from the audience, we really thanks all the panelists for joining us in this webinar. And we really thanks uh, Olympus for the support. And we really thanks the European Rhinologic Society uh, and the junior board of the society. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you for the invitation.